Welcome to the Women Abroad Podcast. I'm your host, Lisette Esquivel. This show is part of the section Women Who Inspire, where you will learn stories and experiences of successful female expats from all over the world. They will share with us the secret that nobody is willing to tell you about living overseas. Welcome to another episode of Women Abroad. My name is Lisa Esquivel, Global Editor on Wallop.com. And today we're going to travel to North America. We're going to travel to Canada with Sarah. Okay, I will tell you a little bit about Sarah Bogramia. Uh, she's from Armenia, but she was raised in Ukraine, living now in Toronto, Canada. At the age of 21, Sarah made her hardest and greatest decision in her life. She moved to Canada on her own to build a new life. Despite of the successful career in marketing for five years, she found herself unhappy and unfulfilled. That's made her to embark on the self-discovery, soul-searching journey. And that's when she found her true passion, helping women living abroad to build a successful life, personal and professional network through a deep mindset, work, and unshakable self-confidence. So, Sarah, welcome to Women Abroad. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Okay, so let's get started with the first question. Um, well, uh, I mentioned before that you are from Armenia, but you were raised in Ukraine. So why did you move to Toronto, Canada? Why Toronto in Canada? Why? In that, in that other country, you know? Yeah, I've definitely considered a lot of countries that I wanted to move to, but I traveled when I was 19. I've traveled to the UK and to a couple more countries in Europe. And what I loved about UK, especially London, when I was learning English there, I really loved that I had this multicultural community. And it was the first time for me when I had so many people from different communities, from different cultures coming together. And that's when I've discovered that I want to be in an environment like that. So I've started looking for the countries that have that multicultural, diverse sort of um, aspect of it. And Canada happened to be a good option because of the immigration process, because I really like people in Canada. I've talked to a lot of people over the phone before moving here. And, um, you know, there's this myth that Canadians are nice. It's actually not myth that all Canadians are very nice. <laughs> and um, I, love the, I love the culture and I love the fact that there is so many people from different countries and they're living together as one. Amazing. Yeah. It's, it's right. I have been in Canada and, and I was surprised that the people are very polite, extremely polite. And, and this is very difficult to find, you know, in another uh, countries. So uh, how many years have, have you been living there? It's going to be eight years, actually, in five days. Wow. Eight years. Nice. So tell us a little bit about your background. Um, uh, when you live in Ukraine, you uh, you were working in marketing, and but when you moved to Canada, you uh, you changed your career for uh, to become a coach, right? So I was in a bit of a marketing in Ukraine, and then I came to Canada, and I was continuing my marketing journey. I went to school for marketing a bit more to deepen my knowledge, and then I started my career in marketing in Canada as well. And it's been, it's been a great journey. I loved it. And for the first couple of years, I was very much excited about it. But at some point, um, I've found the way, I just found myself not happy, not fulfilled. You know, the, the feeling when you wake up in the morning and you know you're doing something that you're not called to do. Um, that you're doing something that you're good at, but not necessarily what gives that gives you that spark, give you that joy. And that's when I started looking for myself in a different way through self-development, through mentorship with multiple people. And I stumbled across coaching, which um, I found first of 
the small course, it was a 10 day course on how to discover yourself or rediscover yourself. And after watching that course, like the very first day of it, actually, I remember I had this like calling in me. I had this like in every single part of my body, I knew that I had to make a change and I knew that I had to learn that craft and do what those people are doing right now and how they're helping me. I wanna help someone like that in the future. And that's how I shifted to coaching. Wow. So, and, and in marketing, what activities did you do? You were uh, more focused on, and, on a brand strategist or what did you do exactly? I'm just curious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So mm -hmm. I was doing brand strategy and marketing. A lot of it was digital marketing. So I was part of the media planning of the planning of big campaigns that you see on TVs and the ones that you see on social media. So it was kind of a full 360. Yeah. Mm, kind of advertising. The, yes, the exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the, after that course that you mentioned, did you study, a, I guess, um, a certification to become a coach or how did you start, you know, to be a, have the credentials to have the people? Because to become, to be a coach, it's, it's not easy if you are a good coach, you know? Some people say, oh, I'm a coach, but in reality, they don't study uh, in official, you know, schools or institutions. And it's important that they know that there are people who have uh, the knowledge and the, the credentials to do the job. Yeah, exactly. And that's why I wanted to go through a certification program. And I went through an NLP and hypnotherapy certification program. And I've got certified by the National Board of Coaches. The program is really about, if you're not familiar with NLP, in two words, the simple way to describe it, it's basically a manual for your mind. It helps you to understand your thoughts and your emotions and understand how those thoughts and emotions impact your reality and impact your life. Wow, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then hypnotherapy in a very traditional way that you might have heard about it. Previously, you, you might have seen hypnotherapists on the TV. Yeah. They do a bit of a show. You know, um, it is a bit more of an entertaining part of the hypnotherapy. What I'm doing, I'm working with subconscious mind and reprogramming subconscious mind through hypnotherapy. So you are basically entering the state of relaxation with me guiding you through the, um, through the certain language. And it allows you to sort of relax. And when we're relaxing, our conscious mind sort of steps aside. And that's where our subconscious mind sort of opens up. And that's when we can start changing things on the subconscious level. Mm -hmm. I, well, you know, some people have, oh, I, I include myself, uh, that, you know, we heard these stories that maybe it's a kind of dangerous because if, what happened if you never get back to your conscious mind, blah, blah. It, it, it's in uh, it, it's really a, a myth or, or or it's totally safe this practice hypnotherapy is absolutely safe for you there is it's, it's a myth that you fall asleep it's a myth that you're not in control of your body when you're hypnotized that's not true you're actually absolutely in control and you know what you're doing so you're still conscious you're not sleeping you're just relax. So think about it as a, maybe like something similar to meditation when you oh, still, yeah. right. When you still mm -hmm. know what you're doing, you're aware of what's happening, but you are going deeper into yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I, I get it. I get it. Okay. Similar process. Amazing. So very interesting what you're saying. And now tell us a little bit about what stereotypes did you face for being Ukrainian in Canada? I think one of the first ones, and this is a funny one, is that because it's Ukraine, because it's Eastern European country, and I also speak Russian, so a lot of people think that I'm also Russian, even though I'm not, but I speak that language. So the stereotype is that I drink a lot of vodka, just for no <laughs> reason. <laughs> and no, it's, it's, isn't that true? <laughs> That's not true, actually. I don't drink that much or as much as people think. Mm -hmm. The thing that every day I go to bed and like it's, it's a shot of vodka before I go to bed, which is not true. <laughs> so there was a funny stereotype there. Um, 
but I understand why. I understand the reason behind it. Um, and then I think the second one was around um, Ukrainian slash Armenian, because I'm sort of a mix of both. People were trying to understand where I come from and who I am really. So there was the stereotype that um, since you have two cultures in you, you probably equally relate to both of them and you call yourself Armenian and Ukrainian at the same time, which I don't. I call myself Armenian because that's where my roots are. That's where my background is. Um, and I just grew up in Ukraine and I know the culture, but it's not part of me. Yeah, you are only your, your culture for you is Ukraine. Uh, you know, you, you know, well, it's from Ukraine and now uh, Canada. And, and, and for example, you, you mentioned that you, you speak uh, Russian. This is because uh, they are neighbors and for you was very easy to learn the language or because you like it or what? Yeah, so in Ukraine, you speak Russian and Ukrainian. It's sort of a Russian is a second language in Ukraine. So everyone oh. pretty much speaks Russian. Well, it's a good, it's a good for you because it's a very difficult language for every, uh, you know, Russian is extremely complicated. So for you, it's like a EC, no? And you speak English and you're a Ukrainian. So that's good. And the Russians yeah. are very good clients. You know, they are rich, most of them. Uh, they they are, have a very good economy right now in Europe. So amazing. Yeah. Okay, well, the start is not so bad. Um, uh, okay, uh, now talking about the challenges, uh, what challenges did you encounter and how did you overcome them? living in, in mm -hmm. you know, in Canada? So I think one of the first challenges was for me, the fact that I moved to Canada by myself and I didn't have any family here or any friends. Even though I was talking to a couple of people online, I didn't really have that social circle here. So when I moved, a lot of the days I felt lonely. It's that loneliness that kicks in when, you know, you don't have plans on the weekends and everyone else does. It was, it was a tough, the first couple of months until I started building that friendship and that social circle. And to build that social circle, for me personally, that was a challenge too, because I was very much a shy person. I was not so confident in what I'm saying, how I'm saying it. My English wasn't that great. Um, you know, I was, I was very much closed up. So for me to go out there and meet new people and introduce myself, and try to find friends and whether it's a coffee shop or there is like this networking meetings that I would go to. And I remember every single networking meeting was like a very stressful thing for me. because so I was like, oh, I gotta talk about myself now. I gotta introduce myself now and it's hard. Um, so that was the, the challenge there in terms of building that network when you start from scratch in a new country. You know, when you move to a new country, it's sort of like, I like to think about it as a metaphor of a replanting a tree. So you have a tree in your own country, right? And you've got your roots and everything and you're standing real strong. And then you take that tree and you move it to completely different ground. And now it's got to grow those roots again from scratch and get nice and solid on the ground again. And I've always felt like that movement for me was the most painful and the most challenging part. And Once takes time, you know, to that the tree, you know, uh, if it's, it's good and start growing again, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Take some time to grow. So that was it. And, and so in the beginning, the language was a, a challenge as well, because you mentioned at the beginning, you didn't speak the language or you felt that you didn't. But so you take a, did you take a, a course or to little by little improve or, or what did you do to improve your English? I did not take a course and my English was, it was okay. I, I can't say that it was bad, but it was definitely not as fast as everyone else around me. I didn't take a course. I wanted to learn English from actually communicating with people and talking to people. And it was another way for me to push myself out of the comfort zone, right? because if I don't put myself out there, I'm not gonna learn English and this is never gonna happen. So I, I have to do it. It was another, another motivational thing for me. Good, any other challenge or oh, that's all? 
Uh, the challenge of finding a job in a different country, for sure. Um, when we're talking since as international, I was an international student at first. So obviously I didn't have a lot of work experience or experience at all in Canada. And getting that first step in the door is, is a bit challenging. You really got to convince your worker that even though your experience is in a different country, it still applies in Canada. Mm -hmm. And for example, now I'm talking about, uh, do you, what is your immigration status? You are a resident, a citizen, or you just have a permission to work? I'm a permanent resident now. So I'm on my way to citizenship. Um, I'm a permanent resident. Okay, so not so complicated because uh, you know in the USA it's very difficult sometimes to get a uh, to to be resident. So in, it seems like in Canada, I have I I have heard that it's easier, as you mentioned in the beginning, that regulations are are mm -hmm. not so bad compared to to other countries. Um, okay, and what differences do, do you find in work culture in, in Ukraine if you had the opportunity to work? And in Canada, the differences in leadership, maybe schedules, you know, benefits or something like that, that we can have an idea uh, about these uh, aspects about um, work culture. Mm -hmm. So I would say what was interesting for me is in, that in Canada, a lot of people work extra hours. A lot of people put that extra effort in there for the promotion. And it feels like this big race where you just got to do more and more and more in order to get promoted. Um, and a lot of people are okay with it. They're okay to put extra hours in and not to have a nine to five job, at least in my area, in my marketing industry, right? Versus in Ukraine, people are a bit more mindful of the work-life balance and they really want to maintain that. So the idea of working past five is not, uh, it's not in culture. It's not a thing. People usually separate from work after five and they go do their own thing versus in Canada here, I see a lot of people thriving towards the best, which is amazing. And they're going back to work after dinner or going back to work after five. So that was a difference for me in terms of the benefits package. Um, Definitely great benefit packages in Canada. The companies, a lot of companies offer great dental coverage, etc. So in terms of your insurance, you will be a very, in a very good spot, I'd say. And then another good thing is the culture of the companies itself. A lot of companies here thrive towards having that community sort of thing where you feel like you're just not working for someone, when you feel like you're part of something bigger, when you have a vision together as a team and you're going towards it, that vision. So it's much more inspiring. It's much more people-oriented, um, team-oriented, that collaboration, that energy in the team. Um, and I find it amazing. Like I love that there is so much talk about human aspect in, in your day-to-day -day work. So in general, it's better to work in Canada than in Ukraine. In general, for benefits, all the stuff that you mentioned. Wow. Yeah. Good to know. Interesting. And I didn't know that people work extra hours, you know, because in, I don't know, in the USA, well, it depends on, but in general, yeah, Europe, it's like trying to have a, 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 a you know, they, the people there try to, have some free time for uh, doing other things, you know, have a, a relaxed life uh, compared to people in North America, even in Mexico, we were a lot. So yeah. it seems like a many, many uh, European countries are um, in general the same style. Mm -hmm. So for one side, it's good, but you know, but it looks like Canada has wonderful things as well. And do you think that Canada is a country where the, uh, there is diversity and inclusion? Yes, absolutely. I've always felt very welcomed in a country, even though I was a foreigner here. I've always felt welcomed, whether it's on, you know, in social environment, um, parties, et cetera, or at work or at school when I was an international student. 
it's very much diverse and everyone is very tolerant and respectful to each other and to each other's culture. And there's a lot of opportunities to learn around new cultures too and see different perspectives and people are open to that as well. Yeah, especially in Toronto where you live because it's not, it's a very, you know, the capital, it's very famous as, as well as Vancouver. It's not the same, you go to Winnipeg Maybe there, um, there is no diversity there or something like that. Not as, you know, maybe yes, but not as Toronto or Vancouver, for example, you know, that that's more Absolutely. popular, let's say popular. Okay. And well, and do you think that Canada, uh, there is well-being? Well-being, I mean, you have a, um, the opportunity to, to, to be in good shape and you have a, in all aspects, you know, the physical side, social, uh, in general, the well-being, you know, it's, uh, in general. Do you think mm -hmm. that there is well-being for, for the uh, most of people? I would say so, yes. I'd say there is a good middle class here. Um, people who are, especially young professionals, there's a lot of people who are not making, you know, millions and millions of dollars, but they're still living a good life. Um, it's, it's still possible to do and you can enjoy the life it's it's obviously much easier if you're um, renting the place versus buying the place because the real estate prices here are crazy so if you're hoping to buy a place um, Canada might be a tough choice especially Toronto might be a tough choice but if you are okay with the you know just enjoying a life and maybe renting the place as opposed to owning it it's a great place to be yeah yeah it depends yeah Okay. And well, let's talk about the basics, I'm talking about Tor Toronto specifically. Uh, maybe um, you can tell us uh, some popular dishes in that the people um, who live in Toronto eat. You know, it's like they're, it's famous. I don't know if they have a special dish or just a specific, uh, specific type of food. It's popular. I don't know. Can, what can you tell us about the food in Toronto? The food is very diverse, just like people here. Um, and that's the beauty of this city. Toronto, what I can tell you, Toronto is very big on brunches. Like people love their brunch on Sunday. And it's a, you know, it, it's pretty simple brunch sometimes. It can just be just eggs, maybe a French toast, and maybe some bacon on the side. Or it can be something very fancy. People like to um, mix two cuisines together. For brunches a lot so you'll have like maybe I don't know Mexican and Korean so like very different very different cuisines they come together um, so a lot of a lot of that you can see that also in the bakeries so um, I seen the other day actually I had a um, very nice pastry from a Japanese and French bakery so they pulled those two together yeah very interesting fusions um, so definitely brunches and everything around that hour. And then Canada is famous for poutine, if you've ever heard of it. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. The, it's, uh, it's the sauce or it's the, the um, well, I, I, I don't know, it's, it's the same thing, but I remember, well, sometimes, one time, sorry, one time uh, I ate some potato or potato, uh, potato, uh, with uh, this special gravy sauce that was so delicious. We're talking yeah. the same dish, is that? Yeah, is that yeah, you got it, exactly. <laughs> That's yeah. the one. Yeah, it's, it's fatty, it's very like, it's big usually, and it's, it's good to have it in winter, you know, when it's cold outside and you're just having potatoes with gravy, it's the best. Oh yeah, so delicious. Yeah, I remember it was French fries, French fries, not, not a simple potato, it was French fries, with yep. uh oh my gosh so delicious so this is very classic but i don't know some another dish or something uh popular maple maybe maple syrup no maple syrup yeah maple a lot syrup? of people yeah. use it definitely mm -hmm. um so maple syrup people like to put a bacon in the maple syrup so dip it in the maple syrup and it becomes like sweet and salty oh my a nice gosh. combination yeah uh, and of course maple on a maple syrup on the pancakes on the french toast on pretty much anything you can put maple syrup on um, you can imagine 
yeah, Canadians oh are very God. proud of it. You see, there are some dishes that are very popular in, in, in Canada. And what about Tim Hortons? You know, it's, uh, it's famous in, in Toronto, Toronto as well as other areas in, in Canada. The, the big, you know, the coffee company, mm -hmm. Tim Hortons? Yeah, Tim Hortons is uh, at the, every single corner in Toronto. It's, Tim Hortons is famous for its bagels, very nice bagels, and for its donuts. So if you're ever in Toronto, make sure you try their donuts. They're, they're absolutely incredible. And it's very, very affordable. Is a good thing about it's important. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I love that the coffee double double. I don't remember what, but it's you know the double double and uh, the bagels. Yeah, so delicious. I'm a big fan. I have to say it. I'm a big fan of Tim Hortons yeah. in Mexico. Only in one state uh, there are some Tim Hortons uh, mm -hmm. uh, places, but not where I live. So so. Mm. So that for me, but I, I love that. Okay, well, yeah. we talk about food uh, now. Lifestyle, how's the lifestyle of the people in Toronto? What do, what do you do um, your free time in general? The people, what do you do um, mm -hmm. as a lifestyle? You know, something they want to go or what? How do you have fun? Yeah, so I'd say, um, like I said, food is a big cultural thing in Toronto. So after work, you go on patios. So patios is a huge thing. They have a big, big patios, especially now in summertime. They have big, big patios and um, people just hang out there a lot of time. Toronto's got a lot of uh, art museums and art galleries sort of pop-up things going on as well. Um, like we had a big one. It was sort of like immersive, immersive, immersive immersive experience uh, for the Van Gogh any his of uh, his paintings uh, it's a beautiful experience there so if you like art it will be a good place for you to be and I'd say Toronto is very big on sports uh, lots of people go because we are fortunate to have a lake so lots of people go cycling to the bicycle take a bicycle and take a ride, long ride along the lake. Um, lots of people run along the lake, walk along the lake. So it's very, um, very active lifestyle, I'd say. Um, people try to stay healthy, but they also enjoy their food here and there. Okay, so food is huge in, in yeah. Toronto and the art as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, you know, I have the opportunity to go, but in, in my case was in Alberta. And I remember that people love to, to have jacuzzis in, in the backyard. And, mm -hmm. you know, even in, in winter, they enjoy to, to be in the backyard, having fun with and the jacuzzi. In Toronto, is the same tradition? Yeah, more of like outside of Toronto. So there are areas of outside of Toronto where you actually have houses. And yes, a lot of people have jacuzzi there. And it's nice when there is a snow out there. So you sort of like go into warm jacuzzi and then you get out of it. You like lie down in the snow for a bit <laughs> and then you go back into it. <laughs> it's, it's fun. Mm -hmm. So yeah, in general, yeah. I remember that it was, oh my gosh, amazing experience for me. Okay, and now talking about culture, um, there is some customs, traditions that you see that you say, okay, like, why don't like? something I want to, it can be a custom tradition, a religious one, or social, or civic, or something, any, any type. Mm -hmm. I think the first thing that I think about is, like you said, Canadians being very polite. And they're polite to the point, like, they say thank you and sorry for 100 times a day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm scared. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, and you got to be like that too, right? When you're like a foreigner in, in Canada, you don't always do that at the beginning because it's not a natural thing for you to do. So if you don't do it, people think that you're rude. So make sure that you're definitely saying thank you and sorry for pretty much everything. Um, yeah, in terms of the customs and traditions, it's hard to tell because it's such a multicultural city. Every, every culture sort of has their own customs. Um, but like I said, everyone's very much respectful of it. 
I love that we have a lot of festivals going on in Toronto too, mm-hmm. like festivals for different cultures. There's like Irish festival. There is, I don't know, um, maybe some, when there is a Chinese new year, there's a huge festival here for that. So we celebrate it as well. Um, so different cultures get a chance to showcase what they're all about. And it becomes this big celebration for the whole city when they're marching along the main streets and they have these beautiful costumes and everyone's cheering on them and everyone's celebrating the, the customs and the traditions. Also, I think I remember, um, is there the very, it's, it's huge, the, the film festival is in Toronto, very big famous one, yeah. Toronto, yeah. mm-hmm. Toronto yeah. Film Festival every September, yeah. yes, uh, and it's big, and we get big stars here. Um, so yeah, September is a good time to come in Toronto. It gets very busy. So, and talking about that, the the weather that is not, uh, you know, there and there is no snow uh, in September. So it's a good time to go without snow. Yeah, so I'd say if you're planning to somewhere around August, September is a good time because then in October it starts getting colder a little bit. And then in November, we start getting a little bit of snow already. So, and then from there all the way until May, I would say. Oh my gosh, it's like a six months of snow. Oh my it's God. It's five-ish. If we're lucky, it's five. Yeah. That's it. Five. Well, the people who love, you know, the snow, well, they can, it's a good time go to October until May, but if you don't like, so it's better to go maybe in August and September, according to what you're saying. Oh, on, yeah. on July, July, it's a good, it's a good time. Also, it's it's summer, and I remember that's beautiful. The weather, people have fun. The weather, oh my gosh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, for sure. And July is actually when Canada Day is. So um, first of July is the Canada Day. So there's big festivities happening in the city too. Uh, so if you want to catch that part as well but in winter I'll say there's a lot to do in the city as well there's a lot of skating rinks in winter so they're outside um, by the lake again so it's beautiful you're skating and there's a beautiful lights around you um, so if you you're, if you're more into winter it's a good good time to be mm-hmm. good to know uh, and for example some people say is, is it true that you can find animals on the streets? Raccoons, yes. <laughs> By animals, you mean raccoons? Uh, yes, we do get lots of raccoons, especially somewhere around garbage areas because they like to go into garbage and they just dug in things. Um, if you are not ready for it, <laughs> then yeah, it might be a little bit of a shock. Mm-hmm. There's also lots of squirrels in the city. Lots of like mm-hmm. small squirrels and they're black squirrels. They look very different from the ones that you typically yeah, see on the cartoons and stuff. It's, mm-hmm. um, it's not like a red squirrel type of thing. It's, it's very black and they're like small um, all over the, the city. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I remember that I saw some animals, but I was in, the, in a you know, natural park. Uh, there is Bath. I don't know. Have you been in Bath? Yeah, it's in Alberta. Fun. Okay, yeah, but, but I thought it was normal, you know, because it's a park, but I didn't know that on a regular basis that's very common to walk and oh, the squirrel or the raccoons. Oh yeah. my gosh. Squirrels, raccoons, and a lot of geese also in the city, just walking around sometimes. Just like um, us, especially in the, the outside city. of the city. <laughs> yeah, they are, and, especially in like areas outside of a city. You. It's, it's almost like their territory. You don't even go there. <laughs> There's a lot you have of to live with them. Okay. And, and you, do you think that uh, in Toronto is a safe city for women? I would say so. Yeah, absolutely. I've always felt safe. Um, there's, of course, the areas in Toronto where you don't want to go, just like in any other city. But in general, it's very, it's a lot of respect for women. So it's pretty safe. Yeah. And, and you mentioned uh, before about that, the accommodation that's very expensive as a big city, you know, in, in big city, the capital, et cetera, around the world, all are expensive. But in general, um, maybe could you tell us in, in the neighborhood, it's middle class, you know, not so poor, not so rich, middle class, um, uh, a small apartment, you know, um, maybe for 
for two people, how much? Mm -hmm. So two people can live in a one bedroom or one plus den, what's called, there's a one plus den area here. So den is like sort of an open area um, as a part of your living room, maybe. You can turn into office or anything like that. So right now in Toronto, average price is about $2,000 for a month to rent a place like that, where two people would live comfortably. Mm. Um, you had kids, you need a bigger place and it costs how much? Oh my gosh. And if it's, yeah, if it's a two bedroom, it would go up to maybe 22, 23, depending on the area again. So 2200, 2300. Um, but yeah, somewhere, and if you want to be especially in the core downtown, if you're okay moving some, somewhere outside of the city or being on the edge of the city, then you can find a place around 17, 1600 as well. Mm. So it is an opportunity, but a little further, much, much further from the city. Yeah. Yeah, but in, it's not, in, not cheap. It's not cheap. It's expensive. No. Yeah. But, you know, New York is more expensive than other places, but. I just have to want to have an idea idea about the prices, and well, the language we we say oh, in Toronto, it, it, you know, um, is it true that you can survive, for example, in Canada without speaking French, just English, and that's okay? Yeah, just English is fine. Yeah. So not necessary to speak French in Toronto. Not really. French really exists in Quebec which is another province. Um, so there, yes, you will need to know French because there are cities there that don't even speak English or they struggle with their English. So in Quebec, you'll definitely need it. In any other province, you'll be just okay with English. Okay, so the language English is okay to survive. And the weather, uh, well, you mentioned that it's uh, snow, starts in you mentioned in october until may and after may what how's the weather i would say the snow starts in november it starts getting cold in october definitely um, but the snow starts in november and then it stops around march april and then it's still a little bit cold until then in may that's where you start wearing your shorts and dresses and all that good stuff um yeah so, so it's until a long September, so you can uh, May to September, more or less. So you, yes, you enjoy good the good weather. Yeah. Mm. So people, uh, they, they can plan their vacations. And what are the do's and don'ts? Um, I mean, what are the, the things that you, you should do or you shouldn't do if you live in Toronto? Okay. Um, I would say if you do live in Toronto, definitely go for a brunch at least once or twice. <laughs> so like I said, brunches are huge. Um, there is this huge area underground, the city in downtown Toronto, which is basically, it, it's like its own city underground. So you can walk around all downtown um, and just be inside. They've done it for obviously winter time. So it connects different buildings and connects different like entertainment centers. So you can go from one center to another without going outside. You can just walk underground. So explore that area because it's, uh, it's very cool and it's a very big underground city. Um, in Toronto, there is, um, if you're relying on a public transportation, don't assume that it's going to be on time. There's always some delays, there's always something happening. So if you have to be somewhere on time, make sure that you give yourself some buffer time. And I would say, don't leave a house without a jacket or some sort of a cardigan, something light that you can put on later in the day, especially in the fall and spring season, because weather changes like this. Weather changes so fast. It can be very warm in the afternoon when you're leaving and then at night it gets very cold and you don't have anything. So make sure that you always have um, something with you. And then even though Toronto is a very safe city, like I said, don't assume that all areas are safe. Um, so be, be cautious and be mindful of where you're going because there are some pockets that you definitely don't want to be in. 
Okay, good to know. Okay, good, good, uh, good tip. Thank you for that. And talking about tourist places, um, uh, what places uh, should people visit if they are going to Toronto? You know, the touristic places, the basic that you should go if you are, if you're going to live there or just for even for vacations. Start with CN Tower. So Canadian National Tower, that's the one tall building that you probably will see in all images. Yeah. Um, so CN Tower, it's a very tall tower where you can go up there and there's like a 360 view of the city. It's beautiful. There's a restaurant there and it rotates too. So if you want a nice dinner, you can have it there. Definitely start with that and then go into distillery district. Distillery is a um, district of old Toronto. They maintain it that old. It sort of feels like an old city inside of uh, the new city of Toronto. And it has a lot of art galleries. It has a lot of small stores where people make handmade stuff. Um, so very crafty sort of the area, very creative area and very beautiful because they maintained the old city in there too. So those two and um, Scarborough Bluffs is another great place to go. Um, it's an area, it's a park where you have this gorgeous rocks and bluffs. They're basically like very tall rocks um, and you'll, you can walk around there. It's a great hiking place. If you're more into active type of uh, tourism um, and it's right by the water. So you get beautiful pictures there. It's a gorgeous place for the sunset watch or something like that. And what about museums? You mentioned uh, the mu museums are, hu are, are huge in, in Toronto. Uh, so any suggestions? AGO is a great one. Uh, so AGO is one of the big ones and then Royal Ontario Museum. Um, that's where you will find all the dinosaur stuff and all stuff like that. Um, yeah, those two. Okay. Um, any website, association, WhatsApp group that you recommend for people who are moving to Toronto? I like the website Internations. Um, so it's a smaller community, but there, um, it's a good amount of people there who move around from different countries and they come to Toronto as well. Um, so Internations is a good way to find friends or just uh, maybe groups of people where you can hang out with. Um, yeah, and I also use this website called Lunch Club. It's not specifically for immigrants or people who move abroad, it's open for everyone. Um, but what's good about it, so you go in there and you can put in your interests and it will match you with a person with a similar interest and it will schedule automatically meetings for for you, for the dates and the uh, and the times that you identify you're available. Wow. Um, and then, and then you What's the name of that website? Lunch Club. Lunch Club. Okay, I will I will um, copy and paste for for the people and if they're interested, okay, they can have it very easily in um, in the copy of uh, Spotify. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Great. And what do you miss most about your country, Sarah? I, I miss my family, really. I think about it. Um, I don't have a lot of family here. I only have my brother. And um, I do miss having those big dinners with uh, lots of people. Um, so that, that's definitely something on the list. Okay, well, it's uh, this is a very common um, response. They people miss their families and friends. Yeah. Um, how did you manage to be competitive in the Canadian market? What are your your keys to success? Oh, there's a couple of them. I think start networking as soon as you arrive, and start building that social circle, that the personal networks of friends and just people who you work with or study with. So start building that relationship. And then networking specifically for professional reasons, there's a lot of networking events where you can go to. And the sooner you go to those events, the easier it's gonna be for you to find a job. 
you're going to meet people and you're going to learn what they do and then eventually you can connect with them to to find a job um, the second thing would be positive attitudes in general positive attitude and positive mindset i always say that you know the problems and challenges happen but if you combine them with a positive attitude it suddenly becomes an opportunity but if you combine a challenge with a negative attitude it becomes this this burden this something heavy that you don't want to deal with so it's the same problem it's the same challenge but it's the way you look at it and it's the way you approach it that's what makes a difference um, always think of a challenge as an opportunity to learn something new, to discover something about yourself. Um, and it's going to help you to keep going through the hard times. And you just don't be scared to go um, to go after the things, even if they're scary. Even if you you find a job and you think that that's maybe you're you think you are not qualified for that job. Maybe you think you're you're never going to get that job. Still apply for it. Still go for it because life works in mysterious ways and things might, might work out. So I understand that these recommendations are the same ones that you apply for yourself, that you are brave, you dare to do things, uh, that you're positive, all the stuff that is your key to success? Yeah, definitely. Mindset, networking, and always working on yourself, I would say, not being, not being scared to go after things. Yeah, being brave. Okay, so two last questions. Uh, the first one, because the, the, um, the other one, the, the last is, is uh, it's maybe it would take us more time, but uh, what is the secret that nobody told you when you moved to Canada and you'd like to know? And you think, oh, if I knew this, my love would be, um, you know, be, uh, Easy, easier or whatever. Uh, what is the secret that nobody told you? The secret mm, about Canada. Yeah, in general. What is the secret that nobody told you and you'd like to know? Because your life would, be, um, you know, uh, that, that secret was important that maybe you, you have a void, um, a difficult situation or something embarrassing, you know, embarrassing, whatever. Uh, and that secret, it's like, oh my gosh. And this way you share with us this secret and the people who moved to Toronto, uh, they don't have the same situation or um, because you, you share the secret. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think for me was, I always thought that Canadians want someone who they can like relate to. And then like, I wanted to be like Canadians. I wanted to fit in, but the secret was that Canadians actually like when you're different. Canadians like when you come from a different perspective and you have, you speak differently, your thoughts are different. And that, that makes you unique in that sense. So I always wanted to like fit in. And if someone told me earlier that I can just be myself and be my unique and different self and people will like me more for it, actually, that I would, uh, would have definitely done that. Mm -hmm. Interesting, because some people have mentioned before in other episodes that have interviewed other, other women, uh, that, that many people think uh, that in Canada, there is no, you know, discrimination uh, seen in the USA and um, you know they have, they have had these um, situations with discrimination for for the race you know uh, mm -hmm. but it seems like in your case um, all things are positive which is good you know different experience for different people it's okay that's some good for you good for you uh, that your experience is wonderful yeah. and the last question is um in the beginning, when I introduced you, uh, you you talk about we talk about that you're a coach and you want to help women, women, you know. So, well, people abroad, um, how do you do it? Would you know through through coaching? But specifically, what do you do? Uh, or maybe a, a, a story or something you want to share that uh, you changed the life of you know a person that you say, wow, this is my my uh, story where I want to share, you know, 
um, someone, a client, and you change uh, the life of this person. How do you help your, your clients to succeed? Mm -hmm. For my clients, we always start with the mindset work. It's a deep mindset work that makes the whole experience different. And one of the things that I've learned as I was working with my clients and on myself is that your thoughts create your reality. So in order for you to change your life, you can start, you have to start from your thoughts. And then as your thoughts are changing, your emotions will change, your behavior will change as a result of it. And because you're behaving differently, you will get different results in your life. So we always start with what are those things that you believe about yourself? And what are those things that you believe about other people? What are those thoughts? What are those values that you've got? So always go a one step deeper into, in a lot of cases, those beliefs and those thoughts that are guarding our life and the guide in our life, we're not aware of them. Because a lot of them get formed for us from the age of zero to seven. That's when we form those beliefs when we're just kids. And then we take those beliefs with us and we take them all the way until the end of our life. So you might have some sort of beliefs that are hidden there in the subconscious mind that you're not aware of. And that's where I started working with my clients. We first dig up all those thoughts and your beliefs. And it helps us to understand how are those thoughts impacting their life and how what are the changes they need to be made so their life becomes different. Wow. And on those aspects, I see that a lot of, a lot of changes that need to be happening. Um, I personally work with a lot of confidence and self-confidence issues because I believe that confidence is a skill. It can be developed. It's not something that you are born with. It's, a skill that you start building from a small, the first step. And the easiest way to build your confidence is through, like say if you have a goal to get to somewhere and you're not confident you can get there. Don't start with those big steps towards those goals. Make a small step. Like do something today that's going to get you a little bit closer to that. And then see the success in that small step. Because based on that success, that success is what's going to give you confidence that you're going to keep going. So mm. it's sort of like, yeah, yeah it's, okay. you're building up on that, you know? So people, like if you have a goal of maybe moving to another country and you're not confident that you can find a job or anything like that, well, don't go right away into a job. Maybe try to first contact one person who works in an industry that you want to work with and just talk to them for an hour and get that feedback from them and see what they're saying, right? Mm -hmm. And then from there, you get the ball rolling and then confidence becomes a result of your actions that you're taking. Um, and then from there, you just keep going. Mm -hmm. Another great way to get yourself confident at any point of time is change your physiology so by simply changing the way we stand the way we sit right rolling on your shoulders um, you can stand in a way that feels confident and right for you so people do the poses if there's a, a sort of pose that feels like when you're doing it you get this instant boost of confidence in you um, go for it you can you can change your physiology move around you know, move your body around, really get in touch with your body and with your thoughts because it all exists as one. So change your physiology. I have my Wonder Woman pose that I do sometimes when I need a bit of a boost of confidence. <laughs> uh, so find your pose, you know, and if you need it, go for it whenever, whenever you do. Um, and then start small, start doing those small changes. And remember that mindset is not something that happens overnight. So when I work with my clients, a lot of it is building and 
I like to think of a confidence as a clothes that we put on every time. Just like we choose clothes every time, every day, we can choose what we believe in. We can choose what our values and what our intentions for the day. And if we choose the right intentions and values and beliefs that serve us, then our day is going to be so much better. Okay, amazing so, tips, suggestions. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. So we're done now. We can talk hours and hours, but you know, we have a limit here. So thank you very much for being in here in Women Abroad for these amazing tips and suggestions for the people who are listening to us. Thank you very much for your time. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for having me. So see you in the next episode. Thanks for listening. Visit our website, www.wellum.com, section Women with Fire. And don't miss our next episode.